Hello everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today for this special presentation on the topic of disability inclusion in the workplace, which we are hosting in celebration of National Accessibility Week, as well as Redshirt Day, which is taking place today, Wednesday, June 2nd. For more information about Easter Seals Canada and Redshirt Day, we invite you to visit our website at www.easterseals.ca or www.redshirtday.ca. We sincerely regret and apologize that we are unable to offer live ASL interpretation services for today's webinar. However, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Easter Seals Canada website with closed captioning in the next week or two. Next slide, please. My name is Casey Sabawi, and I am the Senior Manager for National Corporate Partnerships at Easter Seals Canada. Before we proceed further, I would like to say on behalf of myself and my fellow presenters and colleagues at Easter Seals Canada and our provincial member organizations that we are grateful to meet and work on many Indigenous homelands across this land that we now know and share as Canada. As settlers on these lands, we further acknowledge that our national office in Toronto is located on the traditional territory of many nations, such as the Wendat peoples, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and is covered by the William Treaties and Treaty 13. We are committed to being active participants and partners in reconciliation, and to respect and honor the diversity and contributions of the Indigenous peoples who have lived and stewarded this lands, both past and present. I think this is especially important, given the sad news that broke this week, this past week, of the discovery of the mass grave of the 215 children at the Kamloops Indian Residential School in BC, and the month of June also being National Indigenous History Month. For those who are unaware of Easter Seals, we are a federation of registered charities across Canada that is dedicated to offering a variety of support programs and services that contribute to enhancing the quality of life and well being and self determination of persons living with disabilities. Easter Seals will be celebrating the 100 year anniversary of our founding and service to community next year in 2022. Next slide, please. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our special guest presenters for today's presentation, Dr. Cl Drs. Chloe Atkins and Dr. Andrew Whiteley, as well as Brenda Leslie of the Proud Project Research Team at the University of Toronto at Scarborough. Please note that there will be time dedicated at the end of the presentation for Q&A or question and answer. So if you have any questions for the presenters, you're welcome to enter them into the chat box uh, on your screen. I will now pass you over to our presenters, Chloe and Andrea. Thanks so much, Casey. Um, thank you for your kind introduction. Um, and thank you, Easter Seals, for kindly hosting this webinar. I'm Chloe Atkins. I'm a member of the Political Science Department at Scarborough College at the University of Toronto. And I'm heading up the, the PROUD project, which is a research team at U of T. And we study a number of issues surrounding disability, but our primary focus is on disability and employment. Today, we're gonna to be presenting what are the preliminary, preliminary, if I could speak, results from our study, from one of our studies. Um, and we've entitled it, What Works? What Does Disability Inclusion Bring to the Workplace? Uh, you'll discover it's not exactly what, it, as was all research, we went in with one question and we got some of those answers, but we got some others as well. And this is about some of those answers. Um, I'm now going to pass you on to Andrea Whiteley, who's the post, uh, the Proud Project postdoctoral fellow, who's going to describe our activities in a, in a bit more detail. Thanks, Chloe. And thank you, Casey and Easter Seals um, for inviting us to present today. Um, so you've already met Chloe, our primary investigator. Um, Chloe is also a political and legal theorist and has extensive research and publishing experience in the area of disability studies, uh, bioethics, and human rights. Um, my background is in communications, and my passion is around the sharing of knowledge for the public good. I have experience working in the disability studies area, having taken graduate level courses, and as Chloe hired me previously as a research assistant for a, another large project, um, I also have lived experience as a caregiver of a person with chronic and uh, disabling illness. Um, and Brenna is here today. She is a research assistant who we originally hired to help with a literature review project. 
Um, she has been invaluable to us in all phases of the project and her French language skills, understanding of technology and amazing work ethic have been a huge asset to our team. Hi everyone, I'm excited to be here this afternoon. So the PROUD acronym stands for Phenomenological Research of Underrepresented Disabled Adults in the Workforce. Um, phenomenological research, like that is a mouthful, <laughs> I hate saying that word, um, put simply refers to research that studies stakeholders' lived experiences <clears throat> uh, to understand an issue, a phenomenon, or a problem. And we use the word underrepresented because despite legislation to encourage the hiring of people with disabilities, uh, they consistently have much lower rates of employment than people without disabilities. Um, so the focus of our research then was to speak with pe to people with physical or sensorial disabilities that have successfully found and maintained employment about, and to speak to them about their experience in the workplace. Um, so what allowed them to be successful? What's their sort of secret sauce? Um, as well as is, is there a best practices for employers to implement or government to legislate um, or people with disabilities to be aware of. At the same time, we are talking to employers who hire people with disabilities um, to listen to their experiences and to their lessons learned and their stories uh, and their ideas. So what sets our project apart from other studies is that we are also comparing experiences between countries and cultures uh, to understand more deeply how disability and employment is addressed across many different juris jurisdictions. Um, so allow me to unpack this slide a little bit. So we are interested in what types of environments encourage or allow visibly, physically, and sensorially disabled people to enter and remain in the workforce. And so the word environment includes not only the physical work environment, but also other structures and support such as transportation, uh, the work culture, the home environment, and the economic environment. Um, so for example, how does a person get to work? Uh, the cultural environment addresses whether the employee is accepted and included. And the financial context of the individual is also a factor uh, because compensation of the employee needs to be sufficient to allow them the freedom and security to continue working. Um, so our research is also informed by the social model of disability, which is a 40 year old sort of theory in the area of disability studies. And the focus of inquiry is on the things around the individual that impair them, like the institutions, the structures, the built environment, um, rather than focusing on the individual and that needs to somehow overcome their disability. So our approach starts with this lens but also takes into account um, the many different ways to look at disability and employment. Um, so this chart um, shows uh, the various research activities that the team is pursuing. And our main research task is to conduct uh, qualitative interviews um, with employees and employers in five countries. And we've mostly completed the employee interviews in Canada and uh, we're starting our employer interviews now. Um, during the pandemic, we had a kind of a time where we had to restructure because we could no longer conduct face-to-face -face interviews. So um, we started this bibliometric analysis, the second point here. And as a communications researcher, um, I was interested in doing a literature review uh, to understand the kinds of research taking place in the area of disability and employment and to find out like who are the leading researchers or scholars working in the area. So we looked at uh, publications. So that's why it's called a bibliometric analysis. And uh, we were writing two articles from our findings and they're actually kind of surprising to us because we ended up doing not just sort of a run of the mill literature review, but we actually started to interrogate uh, the research technologies that we used for the analysis. So that was, that was quite uh, interesting for us. And then the third project on the list here, Broadcastability, uh, is a project we're partnering, partnering with Easter Seals on and that's how we met Keith, Casey. Um, this will be a podcast series where people with disabilities uh, will be invited to speak candidly about their experience, their employment experiences. Um, we're quite excited about this project as we feel that uh, sharing some of this, uh, some of the sort of things we've heard in our research will allow some of the people we've talked to to have a direct connection to the community and to Canadians. Um, and some from a communications perspective, this is a very innovative way to share research knowledge. Uh, with the broader public. Um, so knowledge mobilization of research, um, the communication of research is one thing that kind of gets left to the last in scholarly research uh, projects. Typically funding is running out and energy is dwindling. Um, so we wanted to do it in the middle. 
So we're also writing in the area of research ethics, uh, disability eth or sorry, disability ethics, and we're we've been writing about uh, COVID-19 a bit. Uh, we have one article published, and Coley's working on another one with a, a different team. And then finally, we're going to be doing uh, teaching a course on research ethics and methodology about some of the things we've learned. So um, we wanted to just briefly go over some of the demographics of our participants. Um, right now, we have a 50-50 split between male and female, which is how it worked out. And in terms of age, it's quite evenly distributed as well. Just one thing to note, if you can't see the small print, this is kind of small print, we, we were having issues with making the font larger. Um, the blue section is uh, starts at age 25. So um, the youngest person we interviewed was 25, and that's um, partly a result of the fact that we're kind of asking people who are successfully employed. So up to that age, you know, people are still working on their careers, they might have part time um, jobs, so they might not have signed up at uh, those people in the younger age category. Anyways, we have quite a good, uh, a nice equal age distribution um, between our participants. And then some other questions we asked in terms of demographics where where people lived, which province. So again, we've got um, a third from Ontario, that's the green bar, 20-ish um, percent from Quebec, um, 17 from BC, 17 from Alberta, and then 6% from Atlantic. And uh, we, we would like to talk, we're trying to get coverage across Canada, uh, just sort of geographically, doing our best. Um, and then the level of education was another question we asked our participants. And um, interestingly, everybody uh, had post-secondary, some sort of post-secondary education. And over 50% of the people we've talked to have had advanced university degrees. So um, that might be something uh, that's uh, potentially significant we'll keep an eye on. So um, I will now turn the presentation over to Chloe to discuss our data and our preliminary findings of our Canadian interviews so far. Oh, thank you, Andrea. Um, thanks for covering all of that. Uh, I just want to say before I begin that I've been really, really fortunate um, in assembling, uh, once I got the grant and assembling a team, a research team, I've been really fortunate in that the members uh, that I've gathered have been really wonderful to work with and they're bright and capable and energetic and have brought a lot to, to the process. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. Anyway, um, this is quickly on this slide. What I wanted to talk to you about was that um, we had originally, we were looking at supports around individuals, we were speaking to individuals, but I really was interested because I, I want to know what facilitated their success. But in speaking to them, we couldn't ignore some of those themes that emerged about these individuals as well as we spoke to them and that some of these are, the, are, are on the slide and I'm going to talk to, about, talk to you about them. Um, one is education. The other is they all have a level of self-awareness and, and a resourcefulness, and uh, they seem to be experienced problem solvers. They demonstrate a lot of flexibility and adaptability, as well as persistence and resilience. Um, and they also required and seem to all have and have navigated so that they had strong networks, reliable and accessible transportation and housing. Next slide, please. Now on this slide, what I'm going to do just before we move on is, so what I'm just on each slide, um, it, I find slides are a little awkward in the New Zoom era because I usually have very empty slides, but then I found them to be too empty in Zoom, so maybe they're too busy this time. I'm leaving um, just some quotes up from our, our study. So I'm just going to read the one at the bottom there. I'm a, this is, these are people we spoke to. I'm of the opinion, if you're disabled, you have to be better than average or you don't stick. I've always really worked hard to make sure that I'm at the top of the game. I've always made sure, whoops, to, um, I just lost, I apologize. I've just lost my Zoom screen. Um, I've always made sure uh, to learn extra, th I've learned extra things. Now, with regard to this, we found that 100% of participants had upgraded their education and qualifications, and 75% of employees had undergraduate degrees, and 50% of employees had graduate level training. That's, you've already seen that on the previous slide. Almost um, all expressed an interest in furthering their qualifications if it would improve their productivity or their employability. They just, they were, they were on it all the time. As, as part of this, they all had a level of self-awareness. All participants exhibited a high degree of self-awareness and understanding of their own strengths and weaknesses. 
Several spoke of declining lateral transfers of promotions at jobs to jobs which they felt were not a good match with their abilities. They didn't want to take a promotion or raise unless they felt they were a good fit for the position. Interviewees seemed to have a good understanding of their impairments and how they would function with different demands and in varying environments. As well, they seem to also have a very clear grasp of their own intellectual and professional skills that they brought to the table. One participant who, I'll just give you an example, one participant who'd been a successful cafe owner prior to becoming disabled, understood that that was just something she couldn't do anymore. And she requalified and changed her career directory, trajectory utterly and became very successful in, in that new um, career path. Another interviewee who was a physician understood very clearly how she needs to modify her role within her group practice. Um, she continued in her specialty, but modified the types of procedures she conducted in her schedule. She also figured out how she could be of best use to her professional partners because she remained within her group. And she's now been practicing for almost a decade in this manner. Next slide, please. We also discovered a high degree of resourcefulness in the people we, with, we interviewed. With, they excelled at problem solving. 100% of our interviewees had already conceived of innovative ways in which to facilitate their own work. They accommodated themselves. I'm gonna age myself by, here by saying that they MacGyvered their way out of situations. Here I'm referring to an ancient television series whose lead character could use arbitrary and ordinary materials to fabricate all sorts of helpful substances and, uh, and devices. And so they were really self-reliant. They just demonstrated an ability to think laterally when confronting obstacles. They weren't phased by an obstacle or difficulty. They use this skill not only to facilitate themselves, but to address problems and project planning that their organizations confronted as well. After some reflection, I concluded that, that as these disabled individuals constantly need to assess situations and problematize things in order just to navigate the inaccessible world around them, or even to address those, to address um, how their impairments interact with the world. As a result, the resourceful, they have a very high, res the resourcefulness muscle, if I'm going to call it that, is highly developed. Um, and here it says, with disability, there's an underlying innovation and creativity and a, a sort of can-do problem solving. This was an individual who was reflecting on sort of the what she thought disability sort of brought to her. Next slide, please. As I said, most uh, of these individuals had already thought of workarounds for their various differences or in terms of in the workplace and elsewhere. For example, a number of people we spoke to worked in IT. They spoke of having written code to link their own software, their adaptive software to company systems so they could be more efficient. And they also told us of how they'd used this skill to further their employer's overall productivity or innov and innovation. I'm gonna read a quote from one of our French interviews. I've not used many of our French interviewees in this presentation because when French is translated into English, it becomes too wordy to fit on a slide. But I really wanted to use this quote an example. Um, I'm seated 90% of the time because I have trouble standing, walking and moving around. Luckily my core strength is rather good so I'm not too hampered when I'm seated. Because of this, I've had to tailor all the techniques I learned at university. We were taught at university primarily how to use movements while in a standing position. Given my disability, I needed to change those techniques to be more to be able to use them effectively. The patients who know me realize that I carry out my work while seated. That's not a problem. This individual had a lower limb impairment, which meant he had difficulty walking or standing for any length of time. And he worked in a, both a mentally and physically demanding career in, in, in healthcare. And further, he immigrated from another country, established his own business with multiple sites, and also then became a leading mentor and instructor in his field. He did this by constantly assessing his situation and flexing and adapting. Whether it was about his education, his technique, his transportation issues, he was always looking to see how he could do things. He, he ended our interview with a beautiful metaphor of the need to dance. Um, and what he talked about was that you needed to have intention and purpose that was flared, paired with flexibility in life. And at the end of the interview, he, he hoped, he sort of, as a wish, as a kind wish, that we all, all of us could become dancers in our lives. And I thought that was a really powerful image of an employee with a disability, but also of a, quite an evolved and capable human being. Next slide, please. I was motivated to this study by my own experience. Um, I have a disability that waxes and wanes, um, but I discovered that when I was visibly, visibly disabled, I could not get a job. And that as soon as my function improved and I could pass as normal, I found employment. It should be noted that my CV had not changed between two, those two conditions. This made me very aware of prejudice. 
made me very aware that though, but it also made me really aware that those who are visibly disabled encounter a significant attitudinal wall when they seek employment. And that those who are employed that have made it into the employment realm, they've done so as a result of enormous personal persistence and resilience. If you've noticed, I've, couple, I've bolded a couple of sentences. And one is at uh, the bottom, I just ended up being persistent. And the other is you gotta be resilient. Then I'm, I'm just gonna read the bottom one here. Um, I remember learning to solder in grade six because I got so miffed at have, of having to ask others. And when you're holding your hand skid iron, it's like 600 degrees Fahrenheit. And when you have to know how to do it without getting burned, and as a blind person, I vowed that I could learn to solder, and I did get hurt a few times, but I learned how to solder pretty well. It was quite an effort to learn how, but it was quite a an effort to learn how. This image of a blind person repetitively, obviously wounding themselves, but repetitively and teaching themselves and then mastering soldering, I think is a really powerful one. Next slide. Now, in this slide, I don't want to talk about what these remarkable individuals bring to the workplaces. Here, I'm here. I want to focus on what my original research question was, which is what the context which supports disabled persons integrate into the workforce. In interviewing these individuals, we discovered that all of our participants had certain elements which seemed to enable them. In order to launch into and maintain their employment, they all seem to have managed to secure accessible transportation and housing and good strong social supports and networks at home and at work. With regard to transportation, every person, every participant had resolved their transportation issues. This was key to their employment. They couldn't have done it otherwise. Some had personal vehicles with disabled parking at work and at home and with proper snow clearing at both sites. That's absolutely critical. Some used globally accessible public transit, which meant that all of the city and county transit buses or whatever trains were accessible. Um, almost all said that paratransit was the least useful form of transit because it was highly inflexible and unreliable. And so it couldn't contribute to them working on a regular basis. They all also relied, they had backup systems and relied on impromptu transportation, such as taxis, friends and family from time to time to work as to use as backup. With regard to housing, every participant had stable accessible housing. They all had stable residences from which they could launch each morning and also from which they could work. Some lived with family members and multi-generational arrangements, or other may, may have had family living close by. Some lived with friends and shared expenses and personal support workers. Some lived in assisted living accommodations with PSWs, personal support workers, who were part of that building infrastructure. Some lived with their, in their own personal homes with personal support workers coming in. They lived with, with and without spouses and with and without children. With regard to government health and social supports, we found that many were aware of and access government and community programs, though I think uh, we need a more centralized system to where people can find that information um, because the awareness was somewhat uneven. But all of them seem to have strong social networks in the community that work. And the bottom quote here is uh, one individual who is blind at work. He says, I usually bug coworkers to show me the area. And there's a couple, he was talking about a move where the company had moved from one location to another. I usually bug workers to show me in the air and there, there's a couple that are really good. And I memorize the building, which I can fortunately do really quickly. I have a really good geographical map memory. So when I'm shown, I remember it sticks, which is handy. And then, so I come into work, go to my office, fire up my, my machine or log into whatever and just do my work. And if I have to go find someone, I know where people live in the build, building. I know where their workers are. Next slide, please. Here, I'm returning now to what we thought we were going to be only doing, which is, um, you know, what I talked a little bit about as an introduction is what in fact do employers need to do? What, what needs to be in place for people to be in the workplace? Um, first of all, we discovered that robust IT resources were just ubiquitous everywhere. You need, we need them if we're going to have people in the workplace with disabilities, much the same way people who years ago before glasses were invented, there was no, there's no way that anybody with, who needs glasses now could be in the workplace without them. That's a technology they need, it needs to be ubiquitous. And I think we've discovered that, that, that IT resources need to be ubiquitous as well. Uh, we also discovered that the, the relatively low costs of any physical accommodations that were made, and there were very few, there were less than 25% of the individuals we talked to. Uh, absolutely, there needs to be good transportation access to and from work. 
and there needs to be an awareness of the availability of government and community programs. And finally, which I'll talk about later, there needs to be leadership from the top. Next slide, please. Despite the fact that almost 100% of interviewees stressed what an important role that computing and technology played in their success, they also complained that employers often failed to understand this. Employers often didn't upgrade hardware and software because they saw it as expensive. In an effort to save money, managers often would initially decline requests for upgrades. The people we spoke to didn't feel this reduced cost. Costs just drastically reduced their productivity. The number said that once they did get their up upgrade, their productivity soared. Others spoke of organizations not ensuring that all documents and email attachments were um, OCR readable. This requires very little effort. It's built into most of our um, word processing software and a whole bunch of other software. You just simply have to click check for accessibility. Um, but this wasn't done and it slowed things down. Um, so it wasn't mandated from above. Another issue was that firms sometimes invested in new technology or hardware without considering how to integrate it with existing systems. Firms do all this, do this all the time, and then they discover too late that they've got problems, but this has a much deeper impact with, on employees with disabilities because they rely on technology. Um, these types of oversight, type of lack of oversight and corporate mindfulness cost these employees and their companies a lot in terms of productivity. Next slide, please. With here, I'm talking about accommodation, transportation, and physical environment. With regard to transportation, one of our interviewees lucked out in that a donor gave, gave her a van. Another man spoke of how important it was when all of his city buses became accessible, all of them, not, not just a few, because prior to that, there'd been a few, but often they, when one came, it would be the every fourth bus, and then maybe the mechanism was broken and he couldn't get on. And so it would be hours late for work. Um, but when everything became universally designed, then he could just move through the world like everybody else and be there uh, and work on time. Um, and as I said before, many spoke of the limited, uh, the really limited use of the paratransit system, and it was very impoverished. Um, they also emphasized those who did use vehicles, and many of them did, that employers have to understand that it's not simply an accessible uh, parking space that needs to be there. If they can't do that, then they need to, for instance, clear ice and snow, not just from their client's entrance, but, but from their employee's entrance. If they do that, then they can, they just need to, again, be part of policy and what they do. Um, Another individual spoke about that when she had to go to itinerant transportation um, sources such as taxis or Uber, that using them then just canceled out the income she earned for the day, which was problematic. So that really universal transport really needed to be a priority. Here, one of the individuals is talking about an accommodation, a physical accommodation was made. So the accommodation was a physical reorientation of my desk. So it was a wall mounted desk so we had to kind of disengage it from the wall and reposition it with another set of walls. It took about half a day to do, but my employer was pretty gracious about it. And the byproduct is that it actually created a more warm and open setup. With regard to making physical environmental accommodations in the workplace, as I said, we less than 25% of our interviewees needed anything done. Further, if I reflect on the research done after the environmental titles of the ADA, ADA were adopted in the US, um, research showed that about the average cost for a physical renovation was $800 US at the time. So it's not very expensive. So the four things that we saw was one, moving this desk. One was buying a, a lower printer stand. The other was building, having a little wood stool built. And the fourth was making an inaccessible bathroom in a healthcare setting accessible, which frankly is the law anyway. So um, it was a net gain for the employer. Next slide, please. With regard to government and community programs, I think it's really important that employers are aware of and also encourage um, these types of resources. In talking with our participants, we became aware that employers need to encourage and be aware of, of community resources. For example, there are government programs in many provinces which will pay a portion of the salary of someone who leaves a disability uh, provincial disability program, pension program in order to work. And one of our participants' salary was actually being paid in this manner. Um, so the government paid a portion of it for several years. Also, any programs that facilitate the lives of individuals with disabilities that make them more able to be in the world, like robust home care and self-funded programs for self-managed care or, or personal support workers at home, accessible housing and transportation, all contribute to the employee of individuals, not just in your specific location. 
um, it seems that universally designed communities beyond the workplace are really in the interest of all employers. Um, here, one individual was speaking about some of the problems they have even with the programs that are in place and why we need to encourage better ones. For me, there's this in Canada, wheelchairs. Yeah, there are programs, but it's only partially funded. Oxygen, yeah, programs partially funded a lot. Uh, so that disability is seen as a separate entity and it doesn't get as much government support. And those individuals, if they had more access, like guaranteed access to care, they might in fact be able, if they're not worrying about that, be able to venture further into the world. Next slide, please. Our interviews with employees revealed that truly inclusive and well-functioning workplaces have strong leadership. And an inclusive culture comes from above and is disseminated throughout the organization. It seems at this point in our research that there needs to be a culture of corporate mindfulness about disability inclusion. But we've only just started to speak to employers and we'd really love to hear some more from them. So if, you're one, if you or you know someone who has employed visibly disabled individuals in their workplace, we'd love to learn from, from their knowledge and what they know from their experience. I'm almost finished here, but I wanna, I have two illustrative anecdotes about how leadership might work. We spoke to one, to someone who'd been employed at a national media firm for many years. He had worked at reception for almost a decade and he figured he was a disability, you know, he was in a minority hire. He was never promoted or integrated into the office and he developed very few office friendships. And he was let go when the recession hit in, back in 2008. His next job was at a national outdoor outfitting company and the experience was completely different. The company fostered him. They moved him into IT, a field he had never worked in, but they trained him and encouraged his professional development. Um, and he did very well. Further, when they had team building exercise, they ensured that, that they were universally designed. They consulted with experts to do this. The company had a retreat hike and they hired off-road rickshaws and had an expert in disabled uh, rock climbing accompany them to, on these meetings. And we spoke to another disabled entrepreneur who had opted out, who was highly qualified and had done very well in one working environment, but really had opted out of staying in it because it was a highly inaccessible workplace that really didn't fit well for her and so started his own company and he advised don't to be don't to be taught around us you know just ask us what we need and we'll tell you what we need and then we'll just get on with the work um which i thought was a very nice straight word as ford's way of saying it um on the left here this quote is really just about we often just think of ramps i wanted to include it because it is about systems as well and i think maybe uh we're learning that but it's it's about everything um so it's something that this quote on the right is one of the employers we spoke to. I would say that one of the big things we do is we make people aware of disability awareness. You know, some of the barriers that's in the onboarding process. Accessibility is really something that we take from the ground up. So with the design of our offices, they are fully accessible. We have a contrast in, in our walls in terms of color. We've got a different texture pattern on corners so that somebody who is blind or vision impaired would know, oh, a corner's coming up. Yeah, we have a QR code in front of everyone's workstation. And so persons who are blind who need an app, the app will read out whose office they're at or whose work desk you're at. Next slide, please. I just wanted to address COVID very briefly. Um, here's a quote, it says, I think it has helped employers to see what's possible. Up, a, up until last March, nobody was allowed to work remotely. It will never work, there's no way. And now everybody's working remotely. But I think it's really allowed all of us to re-examine the way we employ people for better and for worse, I would say. It would seem that the lessons from COVID for this, for disability employment are that one, we all need to have robust IT capacities in organizations. And two, remote virtual working, while not perfect, we had issues with putting this together virtually as a team, you know, that remote virtual working has actually proved to be highly productive and doable. Next slide, please. As I've said, I think we need to have mindfulness about disability inclusion, which comes from the top and that goes well beyond ramps and wider doors. It's much like being mindful of anything else, such as climate change. One now has to consider any decision through a lens of how it might affect the climate or environment. I realize that it may be unfamiliar to do this at first, looking at all organizational decisions from websites and emails to office parties to physical spaces in terms of disability to disability inclusion, but we've done this type of transformation before. 
when women entered the workforces in lar workforce in large numbers in the 1970s and 80s, there was a lot of resistance. And I remember, unfortunately, I remember as a child listening to my father say, he, he was very opposed to the notion that there would be maternity leaves. And I remember him saying that if it was passed into law, which it now is, um, that he would no longer hire a woman of childbearing age. And I remember being a little stunned. We've come a long way from there. And women have entered the workforce and brought a lot with them. There are still problems, but really workforces have thrived for having women in it. I think the same will be true if we develop a mindful inclusion of persons with disabilities in the workplace. They're real assets to their employers. Moreover, I think given these statistics on this slide, an astute organization or company who actively seeks out disabled individuals is likely, can you bring back that slide? Okay. Um, sorry, uh, is likely gonna get the cream of the crop. There is an eager and very capable population wanting to contribute to the workforce and is waiting for it to, to, have to, to contribute. At this point, I just wanna thank everybody for listening, letting me gab on. I, we want to open it up. I hope I've, I haven't looked at the time. Where are we? We're good. We're early, so that's good. We're four minutes early. Um, I want to open up to questions, but while people get organized or think about them, uh, Casey very kindly had sent us some questions that people had asked beforehand. And um, Andrea's good. I'm still unmuted, which is good. I'm just going to answer some of those questions. The first of those was how do we create a support network with an organization and consistent, inclusive language? From our research, it would seem that disability inclusion in the workplace needs to undertake, as I said, a mindful approach to disability inclusion. And that will include setting up support networks and creating inclusive language, but also goes beyond this. As I said in the presentation, disability inclusion needs to be a lens through which one views everything in the workplace. Language to IT software and hardware purchases to rethinking how teams interact, what tools are used, whether they use electronic whiteboards that can be translated into readable text on someone's laptop, Apparently drawings and diagrams still don't translate well um, to using more accessible fonts. I did this actually, Andrew was very pro that and, and uh, revised the fonts on this presentation so that they were more readable to also obviously making physical spaces accessible well as well. That's where you're gonna need supportive networks because looking at things in this manner and instituting policies and adopting new software and technology will mean that everyone and that people will be unfamiliar and will be learning on the ground. And they're, they're likely gonna to need re, to be a way of resourcing everyone and problem solving around all of this and getting things right. And it's gonna take time. And that's where you're gonna need supports. And I think, I think we tend to think of supports just for the individual, just isolated. And I'm just saying it just needs to be broad-based just like we're now thinking about the environment and climate change broad-based. There was another question here about how to create an inclusive registration form when inviting folks and groups for diverse lived experiences. Is um, I'm presuming here that this registration is going to use websites, web forms, and web portals. Um, I could, Andrea and I could tell you lots about this. We've been trying to really discover the world of accessible web, uh, the you know internet. Um, if this is the case, you're going to have to build an accessible website and less accessible interactive forms. We've had found some difficulty finding IT professionals can do this, but they are out there and it's they're increasingly out there and they're more of them getting informed because it's now law, at least in Ontario, in the ADODA. AODA now requires accessibility in terms of websites. There's a very good international resource. It's literally W3, the number, dot org. You can go there and it has international standards that people are, are meant to follow when they're building anything uh, on the web. And finally, the third question we have is how to bring disabled individuals into the beverage and hospitality industry. My answer to this will be to reiterate that we need to have a mindfulness about disability inclusion. In just the same way a business such as one in beverage and hospitality might not have seen any reason to think about the environment a decade ago. Now they are. Because they are looking at things and their decisions through a veil of climate change and plastic pollution, they have a mindfulness about their impact on the climate. Planet. In the same way, they're 
likely a host of different, they could likely host a lot of different types of disabled people who could, who could work in their industry. And so when organizations start to make hiring and retention decisions using a lens of inclusion, a mindfulness about disability inclusion, increasing numbers of employees with disabilities will appear in the workplace. So don't presume someone can't do a job. I think what you do is you just need to, instead of presuming that someone who's blind can't do the job or someone who doesn't have an arm isn't gonna be able to wash dishes, they've probably lost a lot of dishes at home. They, they've probably figured it out. And I think you have to sort of begin to have the lens that you'll just be open to the fact that, that you can include them. Great, uh, thank you so much, uh, Andrea and Chloe for that. Um, excellent presentation. I certainly am taking away a lot of it myself and learning a lot of great, uh, a lot of things. So thank you very much for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through the chat box. So maybe um, I will go through those first. Uh, a very simple, uh, very quick question is, um, could you uh, state again how many people were interviewed for the for your research project so far? Okay, so I'm going to take this because it's going to seem a little odd. We've interviewed 20 people at this point, which seems tiny when we're living in an age of, you know, COVID research where you're doing 40,000 or 100,000 people in studies, but it's a very different type of work that we do. So, and I didn't understand it when I first went into it. So we're not doing data. We're not counting things. Oh, I gave you some data. Our interest is we are trying to take one of the most powerful things in we know and from philosophy and actually from psycho psychology is stories, the stories that we're told and because they have lessons in them. So what we try and do, we're doing qualitative research and what we do is we gather individuals who have similar experiences and we listen to their stories. And then we try, we keep listening and we begin to hear veins and themes that run through them and we identify them and then we stop when we reach what's called saturation. When after we've done more, we're basically hearing the same things. We're not hearing any more themes come up. And then we stop and then we move on. My last study actually was a multi-site study and we actually only had done 15 each site on each category. So this time we've gone a bit more and we may do a bit more as well, but we, I think we're basically at saturation, so. And just one thing to keep in mind, Chloe, if I could just add a little bit to that um, really great explanation was um, because we're doing this in five countries, um, we are going to end up with a huge amount of interviews and data to compare. So um, uh, it, it's, it's also about the amount of time and energy we have to actually do such a large um, comparative study. Um, so yeah, so we kind of, we, we are, we're doing, it's what's doable in the time we've got and the finances and resources we have. Thank you, Chloe and uh, Andrea. Uh, another question came in from Jennifer. Many employers, including governments, are rethinking work structures post-pandemic. Lots more working from home, more digital documents. What might be a few suggestions of issues to be considered, solutions you already know that are built in? Well, I'll say this. I didn't say it on the, on the slide, and if Andrea has anything to contribute, she had. It's one of the things that I did notice is a lot of people really, not everyone, it wasn't uniform, liked the fact they could work from home. And I think in large part, it's because they weren't having to leave their sort of relatively accessible world they'd set up and navigate an inaccessible world to get to work again, and then do the same coming back. That took a lot of energy and time and they felt they were being more productive. Now there are problems to, to this work, virtual workplace as well. But I just think, I'm hoping that we can start to do a hybrid version where people that we, this has allowed us to be more flexible about conceiving of how people can do their jobs. I don't know, Andrew, do you have any suggestions uh, to that question? Um, well, just to add to that, um, in terms of new flexible work structures, a couple of people we talked to, and just uh, in terms of research that's been done in the past on telework, um, there's always the disadvantage of the person who's the remote worker. And so if you have some sort of um, ability to sometimes be at the work site and to socialize and to, so you're not always the, um, the minority, like, so if, if we do give people the choice and their work culture ends up being more on site than off site, then that person working off site remotely does become um, 
I but then, Andrea, I, that's that's in the current model. If the models become hybrid, there'll be more and more people working. Yeah, on yeah. So that's like, all I'm saying is, is like a hybrid model is a great is I think would be a, a great fit because then people have the option of being included. So we don't want the um, groups that choose to be remote to be even less included. Put it that so way. We'll, we'll also develop methods for inclusion like this, right? We would never have conceived of this before. So we're going to develop means for figuring out how to include people this is putting new lens on our on the way we think about things yeah absolutely thank you chloe and rachel um we have another question it's from coming in from rachel uh, from rachel uh, with the interview results it seems that there's almost a need for people with disabilities to have to put in a lot more work and energy than their non-disabled co-workers what do you think workplaces and community resources can do to help shift the extra expectations that are put on people with disabilities or employees with disabilities? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. It's huge. It's, it, we're trying to address that here. Um, there are huge barriers to people going into the workplace. Um, and they are not just because they're not able, as I said, these people are really well educated, probably better than other cohorts. So you're absolutely right, they work harder. And I knew they were gonna have to work harder because from my own experience, right? That, that when I was physically disabled, I didn't get a job. I even like I got invited to an interview once they realized I was in a wheelchair, the airplane ticket never came. I mean, there were very interesting things that happened. I saw it over and over again. So what can we do? I think we've got to stop thinking that people who are disabled want to ride the system. And that any time that we encourage accessibility, payment for their care, payment for housing, that somehow we're catering to these people who are copping out. We, if we actually do those things, we are going to facilitate them actually leaning in. At the moment, there are individuals, we spoke to them, who are in the gray market, who live on less than $600 a month, right? because they are not allowed to earn on the little pensions they have. God forbid they should earn an extra $300. So they, I, we spoke to individuals who have been underutilized all of their lives because our systems presume that God forbid they should try to earn a little extra income that they are somehow double dipping and they are being bad. We, you know, disabled people are the poorest members of our population or some of the course members, we have got to stop thinking that to, to facilitate them as somehow we are giving in to weakness. We are actually going to build strength, I think. But I'm probably speaking to the choir with that question. But I really do think that, I don't know, what do you think, Andrea? I, I don't know whether you have anything to add to that. Yeah, just that um, we realized after several interviews, and we kept on running into these kind of superstar personalities, and we just thought, wow, this is these people are, are amazing and um, had great stories to tell us. And part of it is an effect of the research itself. So um, we realized there might be some bias in the kinds of people that agree to do a study like this and want to participate, want to tell their story there. There may be a little bit more um, outgoing, so for example. So keeping that in mind, um, never are we saying that whatever sample we have here is completely representative. Um, the other thing, because it's a small sample, we can't hope to be representative. So we know that it may be skewed in towards those people that are, um, they just have that uh, attitude towards work that, yeah, that it, not be universal. I mean, yeah, we got, we saw, we're going to see extroverts a bit, but the point is you're right. Your observation is you're right. They are, they, they are in a sense, superstars. What I'm hoping is there are a whole lot of superstars who didn't have those stable, man, didn't manage to get those stable things around them, that housing, that transportation, that economic base even, that they, they, they could afford to fail. A lot of people can't afford to fail who are disabled because if they fail, then they've made a try, they're in a housing that is, has PSWs attached to it and they start working and now they're being, now they have to move because that's a condition they can't, they're not allowed to do that. So we've got to stop doing those types of things that disincentivize very capable people from taking part in the world around us. Mm -hmm. the, the other thing I meant to mention um, in my slides was that our study is a little bit different and it just worked out that way. We didn't set out to interview people that were um, had post-secondary education or anything like that. Um, but interestingly, a lot of studies that have done previously on sort of what does the disabled person bring to the workplace um, found that 
a lot of their uh, research focused on sort of entry level jobs or minimum wage jobs. We um, have a bit of a different perspective because we're talking to people who are in their careers. They have a they have a career that they're building. Um, they've uh, advanced in their careers. Some uh, some of them, quite a few of them. So it's it's a different perspective than when you're um, looking at the research at, from the point of view of um, whether a sort of an employer is employing people at minimum wage, and that's kind of the kind of job that they're looking at. So that that's also a difference um, in terms of our 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 research population. Thank you, Chloe and, and, and Andrea. Um, the next uh, question is, I guess, um, more of a question for myself. Is there a place where these interviews can be accessed or where I can find these quotes included in these slides? I struggled to read some of them, but they were so great. And that came from uh, Ali or uh, Ali. I, I apologize if I mispronounce that. Um, the, uh, the presentation and the recording of this webinar will be made available on the Easter Seals Canada website uh, in about a week or two. However, um, Andrea and Chloe has, have also kindly uh, provided their contact information on the slides. So if you have any other questions to follow up on, uh, about the presentation or the, uh, or the research, um, please, uh, do, I encourage you to reach out to them as well. Okay. Um, there is a question. So, Casey, can I just make one point there too? Um, just for, we can't make the full interviews, uh, the data public. Um, we are, um, being very conservative in terms of um, privacy and security of our participants. So we are masking their identity, even in our talk today, we mask their identity um, so that um, in case, yeah, just, just to preserve their privacy, it's a re requirement of our ethics agreement with our uh, interviewees. Um, we will be just on that note, if you're interested in this type of thing, Andrea and I are heading up something called with Casey, sorry, forgive me, with Casey, we're doing the broadcastability, which we will then be interviewing people who consent, in a sense, to talk about their experiences publicly uh, in the workplace. And we'll be doing that in French and English, and we might even do it in an indigenous language if, if we end up having the funding to do that. But um, we're, that's another project, but that's a slightly different endeavor, but then you'll get to hear some more dis discourse about it. Uh, we have a, a little bit of a follow-up question from um, uh, from Jennifer. Uh, a lot of energy being devoted to creating new ways of sharing documents. Um, in your perspective, how could attention to disability be built in? I think Apple has done a relatively good job. What I've been fascinated by years ago, I was uh, I didn't have much use of my hands, and so I was using Drag and Dictate, and that was that was very expensive back then. I think it was $4,000 and I went on a government program that was the early 90s. And now we all talk at our phones. And what's interesting is that the innovations that come out of disability often make it into the mainstream. Um, so I've noticed that there are, there are features with regard, for instance, making sure OCR, you simply, one of the employers we talked to said, you just simply go up, you go check, it's a check for accessibility, it checks that things are done. I just think you have to make it a policy. You just say you cannot send a document, you cannot make a document that isn't accessible but with these adaptations. But you also have to, again, have a strong IT program that is aware of changes in those programs, new developments, you think, so that they can constantly make sure that your systems are upgraded and keeping up to date. I just, as I said, I think it's a lens. It has to come from the top. They have to believe that this is something what they want to adopt, that they want to get. And think about it, if a, up to a quarter of our population is disabled, they are missing out ultimately on a lot of people. Right, and we have a work. We actually have a labor shortage that we're facing. Yeah, um, a couple of our participants, oh, quite a number actually, not just a couple, um, were participating on committees um, that were looking at um, improving accessibility for people with disabilities in different provinces. And so, I mean, that's ideal. Is you have to have to have people with lived experience on your committees that are creating these new technologies. And so I think finally that's sinking in. Um, the and other please thing, pay them. Sorry, yeah, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people who have not been paid for the sheer amount of public labor they've done on behalf of the public. That yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unheard of that they're experts and they're not being paid. I mean, they have lived experience, that's our expertise, but they should be paid. Um, the other thing we're doing, because as Chloe mentioned, like this is, it's not quite in its infancy, this kind of um, doc awareness and um, new technologies um, that we need to 
create more innovation to enable people with disabilities and people of, um, you know, working remotely or elderly or any kind of impairment, right, to be able to participate in society more fully. Um, one thing we're doing is our, we're uh, pioneering this course uh, with someone out of University of Manchester, uh, Dr. Alice Young. And at University of Manchester, they have made every single one of their university courses 100% accessible. So they will have closed captioning, they will have live captioning, they will have um, all of their documents. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's it's actually an ex really amazing endeavor that they've done. And hopefully we'll be able to, uh, we're just trying to set it up right now, um, create a course at U of T that's uh, following this model. And we're, we're learning from them as how to be more inclusive in the way we teach. Well, um, our, so, our research ethics has been, a, it's been accepted as a course next January. So we just have to now get it implemented, get it going and get it done. So it'll be taught, we hope, in a highly accessible manner. But again, it's going to depend on the IT resources we can bring in to get it done. That sounds very, very exciting. So keep an eye out for that. Um, I'm just uh, cognizant of the time. We have um, uh, five minutes left to the scheduled end of the presentation. Um, there have been a couple of comments that have come in about people who are interested in participating, being, participating in the project. Um, and also, uh, what is the timeline you have in mind for the publishing of the results? And when do you expect the podcast will launch? Okay, well, we literally just got ethics approval last week. So on the broadcast, um, it's called Broadcastability. Um, and we were, we will, we have got the Twitter handle Podcastability. And I think some other social, it will launch, I would say, shall we say tentatively the end of the summer that we will have podcasts up and running? What do you think, Hesse? Maybe even before then. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, and with regard to, we are writing papers now, sorry, it's just up to our physical energy. As I said, I have a wonderful team working for me and they are just generating um, material and ideas. And so that's great. I'm hoping actually we may even turn this into a small article. Uh, we always let people know it will be on our website. We will also let, we always let participants know. I mean, I let all participants who took part in, in, in our study that this was going on. And please, if you want to take part, our, our email addresses are here. You can look us up on the internet, you'll pull up. We are at theproudproject.ca. There is also a French website that is part of it as well. So yes, please contact us. Okay. We probably have uh, time for maybe one more question, um, if there's any. I mean, one of the things I'll just say on that last question is that Andrea is a communication specialist. One of the reasons I brought her, I'd worked with her before, but one of the reasons I brought her aboard was just around this because she has such interest in sharing research with the public. That was her dissertation, but the public's access to what we do in the academy that I was hoping she'd act as a very use, be useful to act as a bridge between what we're doing in research and getting it properly disseminated. Because actually medical research, it takes seven years between when a paper is published and it's actually a practice of uptaken into into the medical realm. So we'd like it to be a bit faster if we could. So. Uh, we have a, a comment from Alexis. Um, this is important. Please know that language is powerful, person first language, person with a disability rather than disabled persons. So thank you for that. And a question from Catherine. Um, I was just wondering about uh, if you know about companies that are doing, I guess, this well, disability inclusion well. In the workplace? Um, in part, I can't start naming people unless I've gotten consent to, to um, name them from where, and I can't, but we are looking for them as well. Now, there are some large firms that have inclusion offices, there's no doubt, and we'd like to speak to them, um, but there are other organizations that truly as, have already adopted this kind of lens of we want to hire people with disabilities, where they've, they've built it from the ground up. Um, I think there's some media ones. There are some, there tend to be nonprofits at this stage. I'd love to see some profitable companies do it because they certainly, they could do it very easily. Great, um, okay. Um, I, I just one more final comment. I think there was a, um, from Rachel. Um, there's a debate among the disability community around person first or identity first, identity first. So it's very much up to each person and I couldn't agree more. Um, and I guess that uh, with that comment, that takes us up to the top of the hour. 
so um, um, Andrea and Chloe, if you have any um, final uh, remarks that you'd like to make, you're welcome to do so. Go ahead, Andrea, do you have anything to say? Oh, other than to thank everyone for coming and thank Casey for um, asking us to, uh, enabling us to share our, our preliminary research results with everybody today. It's been uh, really helpful for us to start our data analysis and, um, and also uh, it, it just feels really nice to be able to start talking about this and, and sharing our, our discoveries and our ideas. Anyway, I just want to thank thank uh, Easter Seals and Casey for putting this on, and I really hope uh, anybody who was here who was interested in this will get in touch with us. And I really appreciate that you took your hour and spent it with us. I, it, it's it's very helpful. Um, it helps us keep to have contact with you, but also to sort of think through things. And we appreciate it. we appreciate your time. We really do. Indeed. Um, thank you so much. Well, Andrea, uh, Chloe, and Brenna for sharing your knowledge with us today and, and your research. We really look forward to seeing where it goes and, of course, to the Broadcastability uh, podcast. So that would be really interesting. And thank you so much, everybody, for making time out of your busy schedules um, to join us for today's presentation. We really appreciate it. Uh, uh, really, we really appreciate and appreciate your support. And again, um, just a reminder that this recording of this webinar will be made available uh, on the East Seals Canada website in a week or two. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, have a happy and safe National Accessibility Week. All right. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.